Hey everybody, it's me Amanda with Once in a Wild and happy Once in a Wild Wednesday. It is time for our live stream, of course, every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Hello, Cedric, thank you for joining us. And it is almost Halloween, my favorite day of the year, so I'm very excited. And it looks like somebody needs some dust up in here, but I guess it goes with our Halloween season, doesn't it? Um, so are you guys ready to get started? Today we're going to be discussing some common animal fears and phobias. I thought that would be fun to talk about today. And hello Richard, nice to see you as well. And I'm going to give everybody a few minutes before I um, get started for real <laughs> and uh, make sure our connection is good and everything. And then we're going to begin and then go over a couple of announcements briefly. And then we'll get started by showing you some really cool creepy crawly animals. We've been um, showing some very, very cute and cuddly animals for the last uh, show or two. So I thought I would switch it up, of course, and show some creepy crawlies for our, uh, of course, Halloween season, right? Hello, Clay. It's nice to see you as well. You must have caught my Instagram live over there <laughs> or my story real quick. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. What do y'all think? I think we should. Okay, I hope you guys are ready to enjoy some really cool keep creepy crawly animals. But before I get started, I want to go ahead and go over a couple of announcements briefly. So today is Wednesday, right? Happy Once in a Wild Wednesday and welcome. If you've never seen me before, my name is Amanda. This is the Once in a Wild Wednesday live stream show. But we are also a mobile zoo based in San Antonio, Texas, and we can service the San Antonio and outside San Antonio areas with our mobile zoo. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, that just means that we can bring the zoo to you. We can bring animals to your classroom, we can bring animals to your office, we can bring animals to your home for a home gathering or birthday party, of course, and anything else you can think of that would be made better by bringing some cute and maybe creepy crawly animals to your event. That is what we specialize in. We also offer animal therapy, including just kind of relaxing and um, wonderful, peaceful animal therapy, as well as animal exposure therapy. Now, what does that mean? Well, that basically helps you to get over um, fears that you may have about some of the animals that you might have apprehensions about or maybe misunderstandings about, etc. And that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. We also do offer all of those things I listed virtually as as you can see, we're right here on a virtual program right now. And by the way, this live stream is free of charge, but there are tipping and donation options down below. You can see a couple of them. Um, one is going to be Venmo and the other one is Cash App. We also do have PayPal as well. And we also do have our Amazon wish list, which you can find actually at our website, which is onceinawild.com. And um, you can basically go to that Amazon wish list. It's very easy to find on the website all the way at the bottom. And click on that link and it'll take you to the items that we've actually selected for our animals that you can send to our door. What a time to be alive. Uh, technology and everything like that. Pretty neat. Um, and we're all experts at Amazon by now, right? So that's a really fun way to donate to our animals as well. We are um, relying on you guys to stay in business, frankly, and uh, times are tough right now. So any donations do help. Every little bit helps and any donation or tip is much appreciated. And the best way to actually help us out is by booking your own virtual um, or in-person animal encounter. So if you happen to be interested in any of that and I will get you on our schedule. I do recommend um, getting on the schedule as soon as you can because we are filling up most of our weekends and some of our weekdays as well with schools and otherwise. Um, so let me know. Let's see who is chiming in so far. Um, by the way, this is an interactive event. As always, all of our live streams and virtual um, interactions, whether they be public like this for anybody to join in like today or whether they be your own kind of personal encounter, private encounter, if you will, um, I'm always very interactive. Please ask me any questions that you may have about the animals that we meet today or any animals at all. I do have experience working with all sorts of different animals um, in my career. So if you want to try to stump me with questions, that's always fun. It gives me something to learn. Um, maybe later look it up and things like that if you happen to stump me. But I'll do my very best to answer your questions or give you my opinion. And <laughs> I do want to see who is checking in and chiming in so far. Thanks to our friends, family, and followers, whether you be, um, you know, followers from the beginning of Once in a Wild or new followers and friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Cedric is here. Hello, Cedric. We love seeing you here on the show. Richard says, howdy. Hello, Richard. As you can see, I can actually highlight your comments and questions on the screen here. Clay says he is ready to go. I, I agree, Clay. And Ricky is here. Hello, Ricky. 
And thank you, Clay, for saying that. Uh, Clay says, yes, everyone should book an experience with Once in a Wild. Please check out Clay's uh, new YouTube channel as well. Can you please plug your YouTube channel in a comment, Clay? And I will highlight that down below as well so everybody can check you out. Hello, Dawn. Nice to see you. And thank you for telling me I've done a great job. We've just begun. And uh, I do want to go ahead and announce a couple of things really fast. Um, just a couple things coming up for you guys to enjoy. Uh, both are public events, but one is going to be virtual and one is going to be in person here in the San Antonio, Texas area. So the first one is on October 30th. Today is Wednesday, right? So October 30th is going to be Friday. So today we're live streaming at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, like every Wednesday, to the best of our ability. Um, but this Friday, we have an extra live stream coming up with our friends over at Once Upon a Party. And believe it or not, we're going to have some really cool characters coming over with me into the studio, um, magically going to be transformed, well, magically going to be uh, flying in, I should say, on their brooms. They're going to be joining me all the way from the Harry Potter world. So we're going to have Ron, Tiny, and of course, Harry Potter joining us on the show on Friday evening at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. We are in Texas, of course. Um, we're going to have them right here in the studio with me flying in, like I said, to join us and some really cool animals. And they're going to be over here um, hanging out with me and meeting some of our cool animals and reacting to them and talking to us, of course, and talking to me. And so that should be a lot of fun. So please join us on Friday evening if you can um, over on YouTube and on Facebook, just like today. If you're here already, then you know what to do. <laughs> and um, also, if you happen to miss any of our encounters or well, programs, I should say, on virtual, um, you can always watch them later because we always have them available for you to watch on Facebook and YouTube. And by the way, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel once in a while. So here is um, Clay's channel. He says, thanks, and says, please check out the Wild Side with Clay. That's going to be the name of it. And it looks like we have a link for you guys to um, go directly there. So please, right after you subscribe to Once in a Wild today, if you haven't already, please head over to Clay's channel as well. Um, we may make make an appearance on that channel. So please stay tuned for that. He's invited me on there. So that should be a lot of fun. And I've said yes, of course. Um, so I would love for you guys to check out both of our channels. And you already have checked our, our channel, of course. Um, but please subscribe. Um, subscriptions really help our channel to thrive. Um, and also liking the videos, sharing the videos, and commenting on the videos as well. And all those videos are um, all banked up for you guys to watch again if you want to or a few myth program here and there. I know you have a life outside of one, don't you? It's not all about me and my animals. <laughs> um, it is for me. It's all I do. But um, for you guys, I understand you have a life. So if you want to watch them later or, you know, watch a little bit and stop and watch the rest later, that's totally fine. Or if you haven't had a chance to watch them all, there's so many videos to see. So check them all out. And if you have um, been on the channel before and you were here last week, well, you got to see some really cute mammals. We had our giant rabbit on the show, Sandor. We had um, one of our ferrets on the show. His name is Thor. We had, who else? We had Iggy the guinea pig, and we even had a hedgehog on here. Super cute. But today we have brought no mammals on the show today. We brought only creepy crawly critters, which we're going to learn about um, how some people are a little bit scared of those animals. So... Yes, I can't wait as well. I'm so excited. Life is just so crazy right now, but it's really neat to be kind of um, forced to kind of adapt to the virtual world. And I've always wanted to have a YouTube channel. So I um, am kind of glad this kind of forced me to just jump right in, right, with the live streams and otherwise. So without further ado, I do want to discuss the topic at can. Oh, I forgot to tell you, never mind, guys. My, my brain did not work. So don't forget about the, the live stream coming up on Friday, the 30th, which is going to be at the same time at 6.30 p.m. That's going to be our Harry Potter live stream. Aren't you excited? That's going to be so much fun. So right from the comfort of your own home, anybody can watch that one. But if you happen to be in the San Antonio, Texas area, over here on the north side on Halloween day, all day long, we're going to be at a festival. Um, we're going to be over at the Arbor Park Shopping Center. Again, we were there last weekend. If you guys came out to see us, thank you very much for coming out. We're going to have some cute animals out there for you guys to meet and interact with and you guys can make a small donation and come in and interact with some of our like our rabbit and our guinea pigs and our cute animals like that we'll try to have some reptiles out there as well we may have a couple of animals otherwise other than our mammals 
animals, but it's supposed to be kind of chilly out here in South Texas on Halloween day. So we're going to play it by ear. Not all of our animals can tolerate chilly weather unless we're indoors, of course. And this is an outdoor event. So we'll do the best that we can and bring the animals that we can bring. Um, but I promise there's going to be some really cute animals out there at Arbor Park Shopping Center. Please check out onceinawild.com to um, see the details of that event. If you happen to be in the San Antonio, Texas area, it's very family friendly. There's going to be all kinds of vendors out there. There. It was a lot of fun last weekend, so I highly recommend that you check it out. Go to onceinawild.com to find out um, the hours and the location and all that, and it's going to also be posted on our social media too. But don't forget about that virtual encounter as well coming up on the 30th and the 31st in person. So that's all the announcements I have, and I'm going to throw that piece of paper <laughs> off the desk, and we're going to get started, you guys. I'm going to restart my camera's timer. As you guys know, that follow me a lot. My camera has a timer on it, so I'm going to restart that. And let's go ahead and talk about the topic at hand. So, of course, Halloween's coming up, my favorite time of the year. Is it your favorite time of the year? What's your favorite holiday? You let me know um, in the comments down below. But I thought we would talk about animal phobias. If you follow our social media, we've been posting about some animal phobias over there because I thought I would try to see if we can conquer some of our fears. I have a fear of one type of animal. And maybe I'll save that to the end and you guys can learn which animal I had to conquer my fear about. <laughs> and that's right. I don't love every single animal ever. Um, I think all animals have a purpose and all animals are important. That's for sure. Um, I don't think any animal is more important than the next. I think they all have a purpose in the animal kingdom and they should all be respected. That goes across the board, including humans right? We're, we're animals too. And we should be respected too. Before you get to know somebody, you shouldn't judge them. And that's how I feel about animals as well. Before you get to know an animal, you shouldn't judge them. Now there's nothing wrong with respecting an animal if you have no experience with them. If you see an animal, especially a wild animal, and they're coming right to towards you or something like that, or you're a little bit nervous to be around them and you don't know what to do, I don't recommend going and picking them up. I don't recommend going and harming that animal. Um, I don't recommend doing anything. I re recommend stepping away let a professional handle it if you have to. Um, maybe back away, get in your car and leave. <laughs> um, that is the best thing that you can do is just avoid it. Now, that doesn't mean that you should disrespect that animal, right? You're giving them respect by giving them space. That's probably the best thing you should do. So I'm going to start with one particular phobia. And we're going to list those phobias as we go. How about that? Ranitophobia. It's not as common as some of the other ones we're going to discuss today, but it does exist. And I actually have a few uh, colleagues and friends that actually have uh, at least partially this phobia. And that is the fear of frogs and toads. Ranid or rana means frog. And that is where ranidophobia, I hope I pronounced that right, comes from. Now we have a really cool frog for you guys to meet. I'm actually going to pick her up and let you guys meet her. But first I'm going to rinse my hands because when you handle frogs professionally or otherwise, this is why nothing weird. <laughs> I'm just going to rinse my hands with dechlorinated water. Now amphibians are very, very um, affected by chlorine in the water and any toxins in the water for that matter that might um, touch them. So I'm going to make sure that we're all having a good time, including our frog. I'm going to make sure I have a hole of the frog because frogs jump. Did you know that? So this is Francis. Francis the frog. I'm going to hold her just like this. That way, hopefully, she doesn't jump down. She could jump down. So if it does happen, please don't worry. This um, uh, There's a desk literally right underneath. <laughs> so she's going to be fine. She's not going to fall off into the abyss or anything like that. Um, isn't she beautiful? So this is Francis the pixie frog. Pixie frogs are called pixie frogs because part of their scientific name has the word pixycephalus, which means small head. They're not a small frog by any means. They're actually one of the largest frog species in the animal kingdom. Another name for the pixie frog is the African bullfrog. If you know much about bullfrogs, you know that they are actually pretty large. They're some of the largest frogs on earth. And this species of frog can grow the size of a dinner plate. Now, typically the males are actually larger than females, which is very rare when it comes to being a frog. Most frogs, it's the opposite. The females are actually a lot larger than females normally, but the males um, are actually bigger in this species. Now, why do you guys think that some people are afraid of frogs? Hmm. Well, some of my ideas are that they may startle you they do jump kind of suddenly they'll be sitting very still all you know a lot of the time and then all of a sudden pop up and jump with their back legs and that might startle you another misconception about frogs is that they can give you warts if you touch them do you think that that is true 
I don't think I would be holding this frog if she could give me warts. <laughs> um, so that is not true. Um, you can get warts from other humans. That is very, very possible. But getting warts from just handling frogs, that is actually not true. So that might be another um, kind of misconception that leads people to be afraid of frogs. But let me know um, some of y'all's ideas as well. Let me know if you have anybody in your life or if you happen to be a runatophobe <laughs> um, that you uh, maybe are afraid of frogs and toads too. See, yeah, Cedric says, <laughs> uh, it scares me when a frog stands still for a long time, then suddenly jump. That can be startling. I can definitely understand that. Frogs can also suddenly bite. <laughs> frogs are predators and they do um, basically survive by being very quick about grabbing their food, right? So this type of frog is a great example of an ambush predator. So a lot of frogs are like this. They'll actually sit very, very still for most of the time or they'll sit and kind of like swim in the water very still, kind of just floating there. And all of a sudden something that looks tasty swims or flies or walks by their face and then they're going to slurp it right in, right? They're gonna open their great big frog mouth um, stick out their tongue and actually kind of slurp in and uh, inhale almost their food, not really inhale, but it, it looks like it, um, their food. And that is going to be um, how they ambush their prey. So ambush means that you're sneaking up on or you weren't seen by your prey or predator, right? Um, so they're going to hide. And then all of a sudden that prey, whether it be a bug or maybe a bird or a worm or a fish or another frog, sometimes these guys are cannibalistic sometimes when they have to be, um, all of those animals are for this frog. As long as they can into the mouth, they will try to eat it. As long as it's another animal, they're not going to be vegetarian. Um, fun fact though, about this type of frog, and I think other frogs too do this sometimes. I don't know if it's every species or what. So all of you um, herpetologists out there, you tell me, but I do know that this frog as a baby can also eat um, plant matter as well. So as a baby, I mean a tadpole. So when they're a tadpole underwater and swimming around, they can eat things like algae and plants and things and also other animals. So but when they're uh, an adult stage in their life, a full frog, <laughs> a full metamorphosized frog, they are carnivores. And these guys actually do have sharp teeth as well. So a lot of frogs do have like tiny teeth, but they almost don't count as teeth. And some frogs have no teeth. And then these guys certainly do have teeth. They have three very spiky teeth on their bottom jaw, Arr, attractive, and they use their three very spiky, spiny teeth for defense and also hunting too. They can grab onto their prey a little bit better that way too. But this type of frog living in Africa, remember they're an African bullfrog, they have a lot of potential enemies. So um, bigger animals that might want to eat them too. Even though they do grow the size of a dinner plate, they're still not the biggest predator in Africa, right? Not by any stretch of the imagination. So they still need defense to protect themselves. And um, dad frog will actually, like I said, grow bigger and he will even protect his brood. He will protect the eggs and he will protect the tadpoles, the pollywogs and the tiny little frogs until they're ready to kind of leave their territory that dad has chosen for them and uh, go on their own. But dad frog will actually bite his enemies and his babies predators to try to um, deter them. Isn't that amazing and brave? I think that's pretty awesome. But that's why they have those spiky, spiny, and very intimidating teeth. They look like vampire teeth. How appropriate for Halloween, Francis. Um, but there are three instead of two, and they're on the bottom jaw. I hope I answered your question, Clay. I think I did already. Uh, what does a pixie frog eat? Pixie frogs eat anything that fits into their mouth, including other frogs sometimes if they have to. Really anything um, th that will fit in there, like I said. Um, so they're very opportunistic in that way. They're an opportunistic carnivore or predator, right? And very, very um, much an ambush predator. So they're going to sit still for a long time. They have a great green color, which kind of blends into algae and like the swampy areas of Africa during the wet season and they will kind of jump out and gulp in anything that comes in front of their face if they feel like eating, which is most of the time. These guys usually don't um, turn down any meals. Now, Frances here, you can see how tiny Frances is. I actually got her and she was only the size of her own head. Oh, did I tell you? 
what pixie cephalus means. I think I did, but I'm going to tell you again. So pixie frog, pixie cephalus, pixie cephalus means small head. They're actually a big frog with a tiny head by comparison to their body. She's kind of small still, but she will get a lot bigger than this about the size of a dinner plate and males get even bigger. Oh my goodness. They're so huge. Um, now I say she, because our best guess is that this is a female because I have not ever heard this frog make any croaking noises. Typically it's just the males that make croaking noises. And by now she should, he or she should have made some kind of noise to indicate that it's a male, but I haven't heard anything. So our best guess is that it's a female. Now I could be wrong if he or she or whatever he or she wants to be, right? Um, makes starts making noises, then we'll know, oh, it's actually probably a male, but we think female and we named him or her Francis because it goes either way, right? So Francis the frog. <laughs> you did and then sun. Thank you. I'm glad I did. Yeah, they're very opportunistic. They'll eat almost anything. Now they are super protective of their babies though. And for most for the most part, they understand that their babies are theirs and they won't eat them, which I find very amazing. You wouldn't think a frog would be so intelligent, right? But their instincts are very, very high. So awesome. So why do y'all think that people are scared of frogs? Is it warts? Is it because they're associated with like witches brews and things like that? And um, some other myths and, um, you know, famous stories about frogs. Um, what do you think it is? Is it because they're slimy? Because they are. A lot of reptiles get bad reputations for being slimy, but they're not. So amphibians like frogs are slimy. They have a slime coat all over their body, which helps them to stay moisturized, right? It helps them to stay nice and wet because they need to be wet. And that helps them to breathe and also stay nice and healthy. So very, very cool. Hello, Viviana. Um, she's saying hello and hi, Ricky and Amanda and Francis. <laughs> and happy Halloween to you all. Thank you so very much. Forgive me, my hands are full or else I would highlight your comments. Now, speaking of handling, these guys should not be handled. I do not recommend handling frogs. And if you're afraid of them, especially please don't handle them or hurt them. Um, we want to make sure and leave frogs alone. Fro frogs are extremely important to the natural environment. They eat a lot of flies and other pesky bugs like gnats and um, mosquitoes and all of those things can actually cause diseases. The frogs themselves don't really make us sick unless you were to lick them or eat them sometimes. Some of those frogs are actually toxic. Um, they do have toxins in their skin. Most frogs actually have a little bit of toxins in their skin, but most frogs are not going to be harmful to humans when consumed or licked. Um, in fact, some frogs are consumed for food purposes in other countries, maybe even here for all I know. I'm not going to judge anyone, um, but uh, some frogs are actually toxic. So I don't recommend touching them and then, you know, potentially licking your fingers. You might, you might get a little sick. And also there's a risk of salmonella like there is with any reptile amphibian or really any animal that you handle that's dirty like these guys. So, um, but we can actually harm them a lot more readily than they can harm us. And that's because they have absorbent skin. And I don't recommend anyone that's a non-professional or a non like herpetologist or expert um, to handle frogs and toads and other uh, arachnids. Arachnids? No. Amphibians. That's the word, guys. Um, but anyway, so please don't handle those animals if you're not a professional because you can actually harm them by putting oil from your skin on these guys. That's why I rinsed my hands really well. And I also rinsed my hands before we even turned the show on today. And I also rinsed Francis with some um, dechlorinated water as well. So I don't recommend doing that. Another thing that can harm them is actually um, basically disarming them from one of their weapons. So what is one of their weapons? One of their weapons is peeing on things. <laughs> so they might pee on their enemies to deter an enemy. A lot of animals do that, right? But if you pick up a frog, number one, you might be putting your oils all over them, not great. Um, also, they might pee on you. And then the next animal that's actually a predator, like maybe a cat or a dog or a bird or something like that, or anything, um, they're not going to have any more pee left, <laughs> frankly. So they're not going to be able to use that weapon that they've stored up to deter that next enemy. So I recommend not holding frogs and toads if you find them. I recommend if you want to take a photo, take a photo and then leave them alone and just enjoy them from a distance, right? Like all wild animals. That's what we always recommend here once in a while, unless you're a professional herpetologist or something like that. We're not talking to you guys, of course. We're talking to the average person um, that's watching. We want to make sure that animals and wildlife are left alone. And also we want to encourage you guys to use less plastic that helps animals all over the planet and all over the place, but especially animals that are in the wild. Water. Those plastics sometimes are microplastics or large plastics. Micro just means small, right? So very teeny tiny pieces of plastic. And some of these animals might mistake those tiny pieces of plastic for food and eating plastic never worked out well for anybody, right? 
nobody. Um, so that's not good. So using losing less plastic is really good. Um, using reusable items instead, like straws and Yetis and things like that, instead of um, throw away water bottles and etc. And you always want to recycle as much as possible, right? Another thing that harms these guys is toxins. Toxins on your lawn, like um, pesticides. Remember, these guys eat pests. So if we're poisoning their food, we're poisoning the frog as well. Did you see that jump she was trying to do? They're quite nimble when they want to be. Um, but that that actually isn't great for the environment in general is using pesticides. There are better methods. Um, in fact, inviting more frogs and bats and other animals into your life will help you have less mosquitoes and pesky insects. Let me see what questions you guys have. I'm going to let Francis actually take a break because frogs are kind of impatient when it comes to being handled. I don't blame them. They're not super great for handling. And like I said, um, a little overhandling can either stress them out or it can um, put oils into their skin, which I rinse my hands, so don't worry. But I'm gonna let her rest for just a moment. One second, you guys. Okay, now we're gonna let her go down for just a little bit. Now stay tuned for Francis's growth because Francis should get really, really large. And uh, I'm gonna wash my hands. That's always good practice nowadays, isn't it? We're all hand washing experts these days, aren't we? Okay, let's see what questions and comments you guys have. Now that my hands are clean, I can touch my keyboard again. Let's see here. Frogs also are a little bit dirty. Like I said, they can carry things like salmonella and things like that, but they're not gonna give you warts. And as long as you don't touch them and then lick your hands and then go eat something, you're probably gonna be okay. But it's more harmful to them than it is to us for us to handle them. So I hope that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> oh, fearing the bacteria they could carry? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true for most animals. It's not just creepy animals uh, that can potentially carry bacteria and diseases. That's going to be all animals. But I find it so interesting in my career that you have far more people that are afraid of certain types of animals than other types of animals. And even those animals that they don't fear end up being a lot more dangerous, in my opinion. For example, tigers bears, things like that. People think they're so very adorable and they want to just go see them. But those animals are super dangerous. So it's a little bit funny to me. But yes, I love your ideas. Clay says, my son Carson wants to know what is the difference between toads and frog? This is a very good question. And it's really hard to answer even for someone like me or you. <laughs> um, but it really is kind of generalized now. So it's funny because some animals that are called toads are really frogs and some animals that are called frogs are really toads. One great example is the fire-bellied toad. To my knowledge, that is actually technically a frog. Um, but most of the time, toads are going to have drier skin and maybe more warty appearances and live in drier climates than frogs. Now, again, that's kind of, there's kind of um, exceptions to the rule all over the place. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's technically the right answer, but that's what I was told, like in school and things. Um, so that's probably the best, most simplest answer to give you is toads generally more drier climate, wartier appearance, bumpier appearance, drier skin, frogs the opposite. They're more aquatic. They have um, slicker skin, if you will, um, et cetera, and less, less bumps on them as well. But of course, some frogs have bumps. Some toads don't have as many bumps. It's kind of a spectrum, I guess more toad-like, more frog-like. I hope that answers your question. It's a complicated answer for your simple question, but that is probably the best way to explain it for the live stream. <laughs> Good question, Carson. Hello, Alejandro. Nice to see you as well. If you guys are, um, have friends or family, or you happen to live down in the valley near McAllen, um, Alejandro actually has his own animal outreach as well, and he can bring animals to your classroom or party, etc., as well. His uh, company's called Contacto Animal USA. Yes, can they absorb substances from what you eat like grease, butter, salt, etc.? So it's mostly going to be um, from contact. So we're very oily animals. If you don't know much about primates, you're a primate, by the way. I'm a primate, it's not an insult. Humans are primates. Primates are kind of gross. We shower every day or at least every other day. I hope you do. You probably should. Um, we're very oily. We're very greasy. We just have natural oil. A lot of mammals are like that. A lot of animals in general have oils on their skin. And all of those oils on our skin and otherwise can affect those amphibians when they are touched. Amphibians have very absorbent slimy skin. And that's why they're so affected by things like chemicals and pesticides and all kinds of horrible things in the environment as well. 
Why is, well, she's, we think she's a she, he, he or she. Why is the chin moving? Well, it will go like this when they are breathing and smelling. Um, it's actually the same thing on um, like a tortoise or a turtle. A lot of times their neck will come out like this. It actually typically indicates that they are sniffing the air. So frogs have a really good sense of smell. Did you know that? Um, most frogs can even smell underwater, which is pretty amazing, especially when they're in that um, baby phase, when they're tadpoles and when they're polywogs. But even as adults, some frogs can actually smell underwater and they smell really well. So that throat actually coming in and out like that is a smelling behavior. Now, if you see a, a male frog's throat come out like a bowl like this and then squeeze back out, that's how they sing. So they're gonna take in a lot of air and then have a big balloon throat, right? And then squeeze it back out and they can make croaking sounds, peeping sounds, sounds, guys, croaking noises, peeping noises. <laughs> I think I was mixing noises and, and sound together. You know what I mean. Why is he so shiny? He is a she, Ricky. And um, um, also they're very slimy. They have a slime coat all over their body. You wanna know one of my favorite um, facts about the African bullfrog? I'm gonna tell you. So African bullfrogs um, will actually go into kind of a hibernation during the dry season. It's not really hibernation. There's a different word for it, but I can't remember what it is. But they're basically going to go underground during the dry season in Africa. So in Africa, they have two main seasons. They don't have four seasons like we do here in the United States and otherwise. Um, they have the dry season and they have the wet season. And during the wet season, they're out and about and they're in their pond or their lake or their river or their stream or wherever they live, um, swamp, <laughs> etc., where there's water. But during the dry season, all of that typically dries up. So they're gonna have to survive somehow. <laughs> sounds is, I know, you can make fun of me all you want. Noises and sounds, the thing. Um, yes, so they're going to have to survive somehow, right? And what they do is they dig. They're going to dig underground, go underground into a burrow, and basically take a nice long nap for the dry season. And how they survive and hold moisture into their bodies is they create a nasty slime bag out of their own snot. They already have slime on their body, but they create an extra slime bag by making a great big giant booger and then spreading it all over their body like a slime bag. It is a slime bag. <laughs> And that's not an insult. That is actually probably a compliment for an African bullfrog. <laughs> now that I think about it, slime bag. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so they're going to put it all over their body, kind of like a little cocoon, and then they'll go to sleep. And then when they start feeling the water trickling down into their little burrow that they created for themselves underground, all nice and cozy, they'll feel the water coming in, little raindrops. They wake up and they go, it's time. And they eat the slime bag off of their bodies after that. Mmm, delicious and nasty. Um, but then they eat it and then they can come back out by crawling out and climbing out and digging out. <laughs> and then they can find some water to live in again. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I think so. I think you are right. I think you are right. I need to figure out how to pronounce this word though. It's a word I never use and it's a, a new word for me, but I was so excited to learn new things, which is my favorite part about this job. I don't know what your favorite part is, Clay or Alejandro or any of you, uh, but my favorite part about my job is teaching you guys things and then learning myself. So yes, so it's kind of like hibernation, but it's because of the dry season, not because of cold. That makes sense. So yes, I think you're right. I need the pronunciation. I'm gonna practice that and, and I'll get back to you guys later. Don't judge. Okay, you guys, so that was our first phobia, right? We're talking about ranidophobia, which is the fear of frogs. So we covered that, right? So let's cover, mm, what should we talk about next? How about something that you guys, you probably know this word. Who out there raised your virtual hand if you know somebody or you happen to have this fear, arachnophobia. Now, technically, arachnophobia covers several different kinds of animals, but typically arachnophobia is associated with, you guessed it, spiders, right? I hope you guys don't have arachnophobia. If you do, oh well, look away because we're meeting a really beautiful spider today and appropriately colored for Halloween coming up. I'm gonna make sure she's situated before I hold her up. Um, did you know that spiders, especially tarantulas that are terrestrial like this one are actually pretty fragile? So this is Blondie, the Aris a blonde tarantula. Hopefully she'll settle down here so we can see her. This is Blondie. You guys are going to meet her today if you haven't already. 
if you've met her before, you're meeting her again. <laughs> Blondie is an Arizona blonde tarantula, and these guys come from, you guessed it, Arizona and surrounding states here in the United States. So this is a local species to us here in the United States, and uh, they are quite large, a large body terrestrial tarantula. Terrestrial means they live on the ground, right? They might even be subterrestrial, like we talked about with the, the bullfrog, but bullfrogs are considered aquatic for the most part. Aquatic and a little bit of terrestrial as well as a frog is. Um, but arachnophobia, oh my goodness, so many people have arachnophobia, don't they? So I can kind of understand why some might have arachnophobia. Number one, there's a lot of bad associations and really not fair associations with spiders. Um, there are some spiders that are dangerous to humans, but most spiders are absolutely not dangerous to humans. In fact, spiders in general give us a lot of benefits. If you guys don't know, spiders, just like the frogs, they eat a lot of bugs and insects and other animals that can cause diseases. And Lord knows we don't need any more diseases on the planet right now. Um, we need more animals eating those other critters that can cause diseases. So spiders, tarantulas, those guys can help us out by eating flies and bugs and roaches and things that can make us sick, right? Arachnophobia. Yes, fear of spiders, absolutely. So you thought it was gonna be Tiptoes? Maybe next time, but this is Blondie today. Yes, hi Blondie. I know, Tiptoes was on the show last time, I believe, that we had a spider. Tiptoes is a lot of fun too. Tiptoes is, our, is actually our pink toe tarantula, for those of you that don't know who we're talking about. So yes, so sometimes movies, like Viviana is saying here, I have the fear of sharks thanks to the movie Jaws. So there are definitely, um, movies about tarantulas and other spiders that have maybe scared people. So a lot of times it's um, social associations, right? <laughs> so we will have it in our brain or maybe we we had nightmares about these animals. Maybe somebody told us something. Maybe we saw them. It was these guys were portrayed as the bad guys. Now I'm not anti-movie. Please watch all the movies you want, but just know that they are movies. They are not real. They are not fact, they are usually fiction. <laughs> um, and again, we don't recommend going and just picking up every spider you see. That would be like the opposite thing to do. You want to actually leave them alone, but don't kill them or harm them because spiders cause a lot of, um, well, they, they give us a lot of benefits as opposed to causing us harm, right? So even um, so-called deadly spiders and harmful spiders potentially, those guys do us a lot of good by eating a lot of insects and they won't harm you unless you touch them. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have those types of spiders like brown recluse or black widows in your home, I do recommend calling a professional to probably alleviate that situation. I don't recommend handling it yourself because you don't want to uh, put yourself in harm's way, but I don't necessarily recommend killing them either. You want to maybe like invite them to leave <laughs> or something like that. Um, a lot of times they have come into someone's home because maybe they had nowhere else to go. If you think about it like that, and that's kind of sad, isn't it? So animals that end up in humans' lives, typically it's because they have nowhere else to go. Did you think about it that way? Um, animals were here first <laughs> and humans came into their lives and kind of took over. And then what do we really expect the animals to do after that, right? So it's not really fair to um, you know, harm these animals when they were there first, in my opinion. So that's just what I'm gonna say about that. Uh, Blondie, did you cause all this mess over here on our plant? Someone needs to dust around here. Oh my goodness, you can't even look at pictures. I wish we had sharks here once in a while so we can help you expose uh, yourself to more sharks or have uh, sharks exposed to you, I guess. Something we do um, specialize in is animal exposure therapy, which means that we would bring either Blondie or maybe one of our snakes or maybe some of our bugs over and have you guys kind of get to know them or even right here virtually as well. And that helps you guys to learn about them. And then maybe they're not so scary. Maybe they're just another animal and maybe you didn't think of it like that before, right? Pardon me while I restart my camera's timer again before I forget and it turns off. So what questions do you guys have about Blondie or any of our spiders? Because arachnophobia is pretty common. So another thing that people think that um, is a little bit scary is when animals have either multiple legs or no legs. <laughs> I find that's a very interesting fact is that the more different that animals are from humans, then the more scary they can be. Um, did you know that tarantulas actually have hair like mammals, kind of, sort of, and they also have retractable claws, kind of like a cat. So on each of their tiny toes at the end of their legs, 
and at the end of each little arm like appendage, which is called a pedipalp. So by the way, tarantulas have eight legs and two arm like appendages called pedipalps. And all of those things, their limbs have cute little teeny tiny claws. Each little limb has two claws that are retractable claws, kind of like a cat. And they can either um, use them to kind of climb on things like she's doing on my hand right now. I can feel her little tiny claws. They don't hurt me. They're just kind of there. They almost feel like more hair. <laughs> so tiny. And they can actually pull them back in when they don't need to use that. Isn't that amazing? Oh my gosh, because of SpongeBob? Cedric says, I remember being scared of butterflies for a while after watching an episode of SpongeBob. I find it funny how people are afraid of certain bugs, but then they're not afraid of other bugs that might just be a little more attractive than, than some of the other ones. But they're still both insects, aren't they? Isn't that interesting? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe uh, we need to try harder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know, I know. Sometimes it's hard to get over your fears. But um, the worst thing you could do is never, ever be exposed to your fear because then it will definitely uh, stay there <laughs> and you'll be afraid forever, which I mean, maybe the case with you, I guess, with the shark thing. Um, but a lot of times it is movies like, uh, isn't there a movie called Arachnophobia um, about spiders as the bad guys? Or maybe you um, you have seen other scary movies with spiders or like in the background or crawling on people and they're, they're screaming in terror and things like that. And it helps us associate that with something bad. Um, a lot of times, too, with kids, it's something that they see the parents reacting to. So I've seen a lot of um, small children who aren't afraid of really any animals, but then they develop a fear because of how their parents or adults in their life are acting around those creepy animals, right? And that is usually um, another uh, attribute to why people are scared. I'm sorry, it's just hard to hold my hand up for so long. I hope you don't mind me moving around. Um, Ricky says, can they stick to glass? Depending on the species. This species is not a good climber and could not climb up glass. I don't think very easily. Maybe maybe if it was like rough glass, um, but they don't really climb at all. So they don't climb up trees or anything like that at all. Typically, um, maybe like a, a, you know, easy little slope like that, she could climb up that, but these guys are really gonna stay on the ground. But other tarantulas and other spiders certainly can climb and they can climb up glass, some of them can. So it really just depends. Tiptoes can, our other, uh, our pink toe tarantula. Yes, there is a movie called Arachnophobia, I knew it. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. <laughs> it's not really my favorite movie. <laughs> I do like scary movies though a lot. And I do like Jaws, that's a great movie. Okay. What else do you guys think attributes um, these guys being scary to some people. Um, maybe it's the movement. I know with me, I'm a little bit afraid of uh, sporadic moving animals. If they kind of move quickly all of a sudden, that startles me. So I can definitely understand there's something to get used to for sure. And the more you're around some of these animals like I am every single day, um, you get super used to it. So they're really not scary anymore, are they? Look at her beautiful Face. The eyes might attribute as well. Um, so these guys do have teeny tiny little eyes and this species has eight eyes and just like they have eight legs, eight eyes, pretty cool. And their eyes are actually located right here on top of the cephalothorax. So when it comes to being a spider and especially a tarantula is a very good example, you can see they have an abdomen back here and they have a cephalothorax, which literally means body and head together. Um, so they have, instead of three body parts, like an insect where it would be head, thorax, abdomen, their head and thorax are together. So it's cephalothorax, cephalo, cephalo in that word means head, just like pixie cephalus, small head in the bullfrog, right? Pretty cool. So that's the, the Latin term for that. So um, cephalothorax and abdomen, and on top of her cephalothorax, which is kind of like her head, right? She's got her little eyes. Let's see if we can see them, it's hard to see. I'm gonna switch up the way I'm holding her really quick so you can see. She is such a good tarantula. Okay, so we're gonna see if we can see her eyes. That's that little kind of, it just looks like a spot altogether. Whoa. Focus, focus, but it kind of just looks like a spot right there. Those are actually where all of her eyes are located and she has eight of them. And that little cluster on top of her cephalothorax, pretty amazing. Now they don't see very well. They can't see well at all whatsoever. They're not like um, like jumping spiders and some other bugs, of course, that can see amazingly well. Um, some bugs and insects see really well. They have compound eyes and they can see different colors than we can and all kinds of things. This animal sees no color to our knowledge and and only sees shadows and a little bit of movement. Her main sense is gonna be her sense of touch, 
which is brought to her by all of those amazing hairs all over her body. Her hairs can give her an amazing sense of touch, a spidey sense, if you will. And also um, they can help her to feel vibrations. So sense of touch, whether touching directly or in the air, etc. Pretty amazing. Eight eyes and can't see well. I know, right? <laughs> um, if she were a human, she would definitely need glasses, right, Ricky? <laughs> but yeah, they don't they don't see very well. It's just kind of um, she's got a cluster of eight eyes to be able to see a little bit of shadows kind of all the way around her body for protection. That's all that she uses them for. This species is primarily nocturnal. They'll come out at night sometimes. And most of the time they'll stay inside their burrow underground where it's very, very dark. So they don't really need to have good vision, but that sense of touch helps them to sense movement coming into her burrow or by the edge of her burrow so it could be maybe like prey like a bug that she could reach out and grab and eat it or it could be danger coming in that would help her too bad there isn't an eye doctor for spiders oh i know right <laughs> too bad indeed <laughs> but that's just the way spiders are um did you know that tarantulas in particular don't have any brains they actually have what's called ganglia which is a network of nervous well it's a nervous system the network a nervous system network. There we go. And that's going to help them to function. But they can't, to our knowledge, really learn anything per se like we do. They don't really retain knowledge. Um, but they do um, adapt to different situations pretty well. Now, that's something, you know, we don't really know how they do that. But we do know they don't have a traditional brain at all. Pretty awesome. But they are still amazing animals. That doesn't make them dumb. That just makes them different. So um, tarantulas do have venom. All tarantulas and all spiders, to my knowledge, I believe, have some sort of venom. And a tarantula, um, there's no actual deadly tarantulas to humans. There are some tarantulas that have more toxic venom than others. This one in particular has very, very um, mild venom. So if I were to get bitten by her, which never has happened, um, she would have be like no more than a bee sting. And I'm not allergic to bees, so I'm not worried about that at all. Um, so, But her venom is primarily used to pre-digest her prey. So that's what a tarantula uses their venom for. They will bite into their prey, which is usually a bug, right? <laughs> um, and that bug will become liquefied on the inside because of that venom. That's pretty gnarly, right? Maybe that's another reason why people are a little bit leery of them, because they are so very different. But a tarantula actually has to liquefy their food simply because they cannot chew their food. They have to drink their food like a smoothie. So they make their bug into a smoothie instead of having a blender like we do. They simply have a built-in system that will liquefy their food for them. And that's just the way that they are and the way they're designed, right? Um, it doesn't make them bad. It just makes them a lot different. But I could see that being a little bit strange to some people that aren't familiar with that fact or the way that they are. And uh, again, they have so many limbs and they're very, very different than us. And they see, see and feel the world differently than we do. And they're so different. But just know that there are no deadly tarantulas to humans. So um, we should just leave them alone and they'll leave you alone. They have no reason to harm a human. They don't want anything to do with us. They are definitely afraid of us out there in the wild, especially Blondie's used to being held, right? And she's a very docile tarantula. Um, but out there in the wild, tarantulas really just want to be left alone to do their job, which is eating all kinds of bugs for us and helping us stay healthy. It's really important to leave them alone. Now, if you do see wandering tarantulas, that is typically a male tarantula or male tarantulas um, looking for love. During the breeding season, male tarantulas will come out of their burrow looking for lady friends. And they will typically come knocking on their doors and uh, go into their burrows as opposed to the ladies coming out of their burrows. So the men actually will go around looking for females and they're they're looking to mate and that will actually only happen um uh, a couple times a year to my knowledge depending on the on the the place that you live <laughs> obviously and um seasonal things and things like that the male tarantulas also don't live very long they only live to typically be around four or five years old uh females can live depending on the species anywhere from 12 all the way to 30 or 35. um so females live a lot longer they're not in a, much of a hurry to do much. They have a lot of living to do. So they just kind of wait for their mates to come knocking at the door. Now, sometimes they're not in the mood for love. They're in the mood for food. <laughs> so mates might turn into food afterwards. That's where we get the term black widow and things like that, because they do end up eating their mates sometimes. So another cannibal animal, cannibal animal, love that. Um, so very appropriate for Halloween, right? <laughs> Oh, this is cool. So I don't know what this is. Cedric says, I learned to love spiders after watching one spin a web. A web. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, I thought you were referring to like a program or a movie. So you just saw one um, in real life spinning a web. That's pretty cool. Or maybe like on a, on a 
TV show or something like that. I thought it was a program called spin a web. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to check that out. But it sounds like you're just saying how they spin a web. Yes. So that's pretty amazing. Um, a lot of spiders will spin a very beautiful, intricate web. And they some spiders actually do that every single day or every single night. Isn't that amazing? Um, this particular type of spider would um, actually produce webs too. But they would produce webs that look more like Halloween cobweb. Um, they do produce webs with their spinnerets, like every spider that actually does make web. Not every spider makes web. For example, the wolf spider doesn't. And they have little tiny finger-like projections on their hind end here. Um, right now she's got them tucked away like a bunny tail, um, but they do come down like little fingers and they create webbing out of her hind end there. And what they use their webbing for is basically a bed. They'll kind of like hang out on a, on a carpet or a bed in their burrow and make it nice and cozy for them. But they also use their, their webbing for other things. So that will also help them to feel if there's somebody coming up to their burrow. It might be prey. It might be predator. It might be their next love, right? <laughs> that male tarantula we talked about. But that will help them to kind of um, feel the vibrations as well, like most spiders do, right? You guys know that. Um, also, they can um, save food for later, like a lot of other spiders do. They will catch prey and maybe they're they're saving food for later. They'll wrap it up in webbing as well. I've seen tarantulas do that too. I don't know if every tarantula species does that. Some of them do that, like other spiders do. And they will also um, use webbing to hold their babies, too. So this type of animal will have a lot of babies. They will lay hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of eggs. And they will carry their eggs in a little purse. And some of them will actually carry the little web purse that they make. And some of them will kind of leave them in the burrow and just guard them that way. It really just kind of depends. There's so many different methods to doing the same thing. Isn't that amazing? But that's some some of the examples of how they use their web. But this type of animal does indeed make webs. She looks so big on camera. Rawr. What do you think is scarier, you guys, that are afraid of spiders out there? Um, do you think small spiders are scarier or large spiders are scarier? To me, none of them are. I'm not afraid of spiders whatsoever. I'm definitely respectful of spiders that could harm me, uh, especially wild ones and things like that, that, you know, I could potentially cause harm. Um, but I, I've never found spiders scary. That's not definitely not a fear of mine. Oh, it was on your back porch in real life. That clears that up. Sorry for the confusion. So it sounds like you saw a, um, a, a spider weaving a beautiful web. Isn't that amazing? They are incredible animals. Um, to my knowledge, there is no stronger material like pound for pound, even though it's not even a pound, then spider webbing. Spider webbing is extremely strong for how tiny it is. Um, pretty amazing, right? They are incredible animals. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and talk about our next animal fear, shall we? I think we can put Blondie away. She did a fantastic job of being an amazing animal ambassador, as always. Look at her beautiful, beautiful hair. She's so gorgeous. Blondie is due for a molt anytime now. I keep saying that like every time she's on here. <laughs> now, as they get older and they are a mature size, they don't molt as often. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, um, your invertebrates like spiders and scorpions, all kinds of things like that, um, even like crabs and all kinds of animals, they have to molt their entire exoskeleton periodically to grow. And then they get to be a whole new woman, in this case, a whole new animal um, underneath and they start over. It's pretty awesome. Um, but these guys, once they reach maturity, they don't molt nearly as often. It's maybe once a year, maybe every other year, um, et cetera, depending on the individual. And we don't know Blondie's age because we received her as an adult. So your guess is as good as mine on how old she is, but these guys can live into their thirties or more. So they're a very long lived type of animal. So we hope to have her a long time. So you did great, um, Blondie. We're gonna stay tuned for her molt. Hopefully that happens soon. She looks like she's about due for one. Um, and then she'll be brand new and you guys can see her again, but I'm sure you'll see her you know, before that happens. If she is in molt, we won't be handling her for a while. Because that that is a very kind of fragile and um, vulnerable time in their life, so we don't handle them at that time. But we'll we'll keep you guys posted. I'm gonna make sure this is nice and secure. Even though Blondie is a nice tarantula, we don't want an escape <laughs> for sure. Okay. Oh, your mom has a fear of snakes. What a perfect segue. So I'm actually. Let's see here. <laughs> I'm going to um, step away for just a moment. I'm going to put some of these animals away. And I mean, they're put away, but I'm going to set them aside so we can meet a couple other animals. And why don't we talk about snakes next? I think we should do that. But I'll be right back, you guys.
Okay, so we're talking about ophidiophobia next. Let's show that fear. Ophidiophobia. How many of you guys have ophidiophobia? I don't. These are my absolute favorite animals on the planet. And those are our snake friends, of course. Snakes get a very, very bad reputation for being scary, right? Now, I do know that there are some snakes that are definitely dangerous out there in the animal kingdom. But again, a lot of animals are dangerous in the animal kingdom, right? <laughs> and a lot of people don't have as many um, apprehensions or prejudices or misconceptions about snakes. Snakes happen to be my favorite group of animals on the planet. They are so beautiful, in my opinion, so soft. They are absolutely not slimy. They're just very soft and smooth and gorgeous and shiny. And I don't understand why people don't like them. In fact, a lot of people hate snakes, right? They're under the misconception that all snakes are deadly or dangerous. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, no snake is deadly unless you mess with them. Now, there are a couple of snakes that are not very common that can actually spit their venom, but most snakes, if they're venomous, they have to actually make contact with you, right? The worst thing you can do is try to harm a snake that is around you, even if it is venomous, because that is going to basically make the snake want to defend itself. Um, and how are they going to defend themselves? Well, they don't have any claws for scratching, but they do have a mouth. And even non-venomous snakes like this one, her name is Harley Quinn, by the way, Harley Quinn the corn snake, even non-venomous snakes like a corn snake, for example, will try to bite if they feel threatened. Most snakes, though, have a pretty benign bite. In fact, their teeth are pretty tiny when it comes to being this snake. The larger the snake, the larger the teeth. That makes sense, right? But most non-venomous snakes have pretty small, benign teeth, so the bite is almost like nothing, to be honest with you. So what do you guys have to say so far? Snakes, yes. Fear of snakes, ophidiophobia. No, it's gonna be Harley Quinn today. You were right on the second time. Oh, and then here's another, oh, I was trying to highlight this comment. Are we seeing Slytherin or Harley Quinn? It's Harley Quinn today. I thought I would bring out an orange snake for Halloween, right? I thought about Slytherin as well, but Slytherin's on a lot of programs, so is Harley, but you know, it is what it is. I wanted to bring her because she kind of does resemble like a venomous snake um, with the, the bright colors and things like that. Some snakes do have a pattern on them, which warns their enemies, but some snakes aren't dangerous and they still have a pattern <laughs> like this one. Um, she does have a beautiful red, orange and black pattern. And then on the belly, she's got an amazing checkerboard type pattern or a chessboard, right? That's what gives them the name, the corn snake. And that helps them to spook their enemies as well because snakes are predators, but snakes also have predators and enemies. So they have to spook their predators too somehow. So if you see a pattern in the animal kingdom that looks like this, that is typically going to be a warning pattern for other animals. That basically looks like a great big stop sign to another animal because this pattern and black and white coloration like this, where it's like black, white, black, white, it's kind of strange, um, doesn't look like a natural pattern. It looks like a man-made pattern or something like that. If that happens in nature, usually animals know to stop, look, and maybe take a second you know, second thought from eating that animal because it might be dangerous. In this case, she's not dangerous, except for the animals that she eats, like small rodents, maybe lizards, things like that, that they might eat on occasion, maybe eggs, <laughs> tiny birds. <laughs> it would be super tiny in this case. Um, but those are the only animals that would actually be in danger from this snake. This is a very, very harmless snake to most animals, including humans. Let's see. Coral snake. Coral snakes are one species of snake that has a warning pattern on them. And it's actually true that they can, uh, they are venomous. But coral snakes have a really hard time biting anyone <laughs> or anything because they have teeny tiny little mouths. They do have fangs. They are very toxic. Don't get me wrong. They're dangerous if bitten by, if you are bitten by them. But <laughs> uh, they uh, don't attack people very often. In fact, they really don't attack people at all. They only bite people if you're messing with them. If you step on them with bare feet and they have to get a bite out of you or you're holding them and actually playing with them. Um, most people that are bitten by coral snakes are either trying to harm them or they're actually messing with them to maybe like impress their friends or just because they think that they're you know, being really brave or something silly. Uh, please don't do that. We don't recommend picking up wildlife. <laughs> we don't recommend picking up any snakes in the wild. If you don't know what you're doing, please do not do that because if you don't know what you're looking for, you may pick up a 
venomous snake and then you could be in trouble, right? And if you do get bitten by a venomous snake, go straight to the hospital immediately. Do not do anything to the bite. Do not try to suck out the poison. Do not try to cut the wound. Do not try to tourniquet. Get to the hospital and let the professional handle it. Um, try to remember what the snake looked like. Take a photo if you can and show it to the professionals when you get to the hospital. Please don't harm the snake. The snake is just doing its thing and living its life. It does not deserve to be killed just because it happens to be venomous. Venomous snakes also do a lot more good than bad for humans by eating a lot of pests. <laughs> Here's a good <laughs> example of a silly movie with snakes as the enemy. Snakes on a plane is probably a big reason why people are afraid of snakes. That and anaconda, right? Anacondas are absolutely not dangerous to humans. They don't go after us. They're very shy, um, especially in the care of humans. Anacondas are actually pretty docile. Um, they're, they're big puppy dogs, honestly. Uh, but in the wild, a lot of animals will defend themselves. But anacondas don't eat people. That's just not a thing. Okay. Yep, leave the snakes alone. Yep, that's the best thing you can do if you're nervous around snakes. Don't pick them up. Don't kill them. Snakes don't deserve to die just for being themselves. Is it true that some primates are instinctive to the patterns of venomous snakes? I believe so, but I'm not sure. Um, humans are. I guess we're primates too, right? <laughs> um, I would assume that a lot of animals are instinctive about patterns. So patterns have evolved for a reason, right? Some patterns, like this one, can potentially give camouflage. If she were on dead leaf litter or something like that, that's a natural kind of pattern like this, shadows and things in the in the forest, on the forest floor, she might blend in. But this type of pattern doesn't really blend into much of anything, right? So that's going to be more of a like, whoa, what the heck does that mean? It's kind of a, a an illusion, an optical illusion, right? It looks very strange, like an M.C. Escher drawing or something like that. Not typically a pattern you would see in nature. So if something looks off to an animal, they're typically not going to trust it. Animals don't trust very easily when they see something new. <laughs> so that happens to be primates. It happens to occur with all kinds of animals, if that answers your question. And I love that you're here, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining. It's been a minute since I saw a comment from you. I'm so glad you're here. Snakes are amazing. You are so right. And thank you guys for being here today. Today, we're discussing animal phobias. We talked about fear of frogs. We talked about the fear of spiders and other arachnids, like scorpions and other things. And now we're talking about ophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes. Now, again, I do know that snakes need to be respected. Spiders need to be respected and frogs too. Um, but snakes definitely don't deserve all the prejudice that they that they endure from humans. That's partially why we started once in a wild, right? We saw a lot of animals becoming killed, frankly. We saw a lot of snakes becoming killed because of being snakes. People are afraid of them. Um, even venomous snakes should definitely not be killed. They are very, very important to the natural environment. Um, they don't come after humans unless provoked or unless we're moving straight onto their land. And if you think about it, that's not really fair. So how would you feel if somebody moved onto your, uh, where you live and then just killed you? Did you ever think about it that way? Because we're dangerous too. Did you know that humans are the most dangerous animal in the world? You know, think about that. It's not really very fair, is it? So we need to be better. We need to be better people. We need to be better humans, right? Humans are dangerous, but we don't all have to be dangerous to other animals, right? Okay. That's something I want you guys to think about. <laughs> maybe somebody should make a, well, there's plenty of Halloween and scary movies about humans, but like maybe like discussing that, you know what I mean? So it really shouldn't be, you know, just because they're different than us. That's what I think it is. I think it's because, you know, they're different than us. They don't have limbs. They're a little bit strange upon first glance. But once you get to know them, oh my gosh, they're so gorgeous and beautiful and beneficial to everyone. Except for your food, I guess. But even, even that serves a purpose. This is a good question. Can all snakes swim or live in water? Not all snakes um, can swim well, but I believe every snake can swim to like, save itself if they had to from drowning or something like that. Not all snakes are in water very often. Um, for example, desert species like sidewinders or even some rattlesnakes and things like that. Those guys almost never see any body of water in particular. They have to drink some water. They might get their moisture from the food that they eat. They might get moisture from the dew off the, the plants and things like that. And then of course, on occasion, they'll go down to drink. And then other snakes, of course, need to find bodies of water to drink out of. 
And a lot of snakes do swim. Not all, every snake enjoys swimming. One of the funniest things I've ever seen is rattlesnakes trying to swim, maybe for safety purposes, getting across a river or something like that. Um, they try to, to keep most of their body like kind of out of the water. Their head comes out of the water and their tail sticks out of the water. So it's like two ends like this swimming across the river. It's really, look it up. It's really funny. Um, but most snakes swim with ease. They can swim just by making their, their, you know, their regular pattern that they would make to, to locom locom use their locomotion. Guys, I can't talk today. It's been a long week. Um, yeah, they can actually swim across the water pretty well. They're pretty buoyant and they can swim. Um, some snakes thrive in water, like anacondas absolutely love water. They can hold their breath for a long, long time um, and almost live most of their life underwater or in water at least a little bit. They do have to come up to breathe now and then, obviously, um, but they're very aquatic. And then, of course, there's animals like sea snakes, which still have to come up for air, but they can hold their breath for like hours. Pretty incredible. Have I ever handled a rattlesnake? Absolutely. I used to work with venomous snakes as well in a couple of places. Um, and yes, I do have venomous snake experience. They're one of my favorites. We definitely don't condone free handling of rattlesnakes or other venomous species. Um, it's always something that you need training for, just like with working with tigers or any other dangerous animals, etc. Um, we recommend using um, all kinds of equipment and proper tools to handle those dangerous animals or you don't have free contact with them at all. You can actually work with them by shifting them into another enclosure. There's many ways to work with those animals, but they are very, very dangerous. Um, but I absolutely love them. They're just because they're dangerous doesn't make them bad, right? They're one of my favorite animals. I absolutely have worked with venomous snakes, including rattlesnakes. I would probably say that rattlesnakes are some of my favorite snakes on the planet. Good question. Rattlesnakes almost never attack anyone. It's typically because someone tripped over them or discovered them, you know, on accident right right next to them. Um, snakes don't hear very well as well. They do feel vibrations and hear kind of hear that way. Um, they have an inner ear, so it's debatable whether or not they actually hear like noises traditionally. I don't believe they do. Um, and um, but they do have a little bit of sound sensory, but they can't really hear you like like talking or walking up or saying, hey, I'm coming, Mr. Snake. They just can't hear that. So a lot of times snakes get startled by us just suddenly being there. And then of course they're gonna defend themselves most of the time or try to get away. Most snakes will try to get away first and defend after trying that, if that makes sense. And then of course, rattlesnakes have evolved with a rattle. So they have a way to um, rattle and warn us before we even come near them. Now, some rattlesnakes don't rattle anymore because they have learned if they rattle, well, they haven't learned, but over time, a lot of rattlesnakes have been killed because humans hear the rattling. So after time, their offspring down the line doesn't rattle anymore and they survive. So it's really, really awful if you think about it because they're they're basically going back to, you know what I mean? Like like they, that rattling doesn't work anymore, you know, according to that, it, you know, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, but uh, humans do affect the planet in a lot of negative ways. And that's one of them with basically causing over time rattlesnakes to not rattle anymore. And they're trying to warn us. They're trying to warn all of their predators, including us as a potential predator. They're afraid of us, right? They're terrified of us. Um, so they're trying to say, hey, I'm here. You know, I'm venomous. Don't come near me. Leave me alone. I'm dangerous. They're trying to warn us. Do, do, do. Yes. Oh my gosh. You read my mind. So yes and no. It is, it is true in some instances. It's not true every species or every place. Um, but over time, yes, it, it's actually down the line, if that makes sense. So like, uh, you know, through through generations and generations and generations, the ones that have rattled less are now surviving more in some areas where they were previously persecuted and killed because of being rattlesnakes. I hope that makes sense. Yes, exactly. So you summed it up right here. Is it true that rattlesnakes have stopped their rattle because of human presence? Yes, because if you think about it, what do humans do with rattlesnakes a lot of the time? They kill them for being a rattlesnake. And over time, we have affected that, that natural uh, warning system, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You can tell I'm very passionate about this, right? Humans affect nature in a lot of negative ways, but it's time to do better, right? So what should you do if you see a snake and you're afraid of it? Learn, learn more about snakes is probably the first step. If you want help learning about snakes, 
come to me. It's my specialty, it's my scientific speciality. <laughs> I can help you conquer your fears of snakes. Snakes are wonderful, beautiful animal. They are quiet. They are not stinky. They don't shed hair. They're just the best. They only eat once a week and they only poop once a week. If I could work with any animal on the planet, you guessed it, it'd be snakes for the rest of my life. Now, that being said, I love all kinds of animals, but snakes are just definitely not as scary as people think they are, in my opinion. So to each their own, but uh, yes. What's your very favorite snake that's almost impossible to choose? Do you mean species or individual? Well, individual right now, don't tell Harley Quinn, my favorite individual snake as of right now here at Once in a Wild is Slytherin, our California king of snake. He is so very special especially for a king snake. He is very, very docile and sweet. Um, some king snakes are a little bit can, uh, cantankerous <laughs> uh, by nature, and that's just the way that they are, and that's okay. It's okay to be the way they are. We can't blame them for being them. <laughs> but uh, Slytherin is very special. Harley Quinn's one of the one of my other probably top five snakes in our collection right now. Species-wise, um, as far as handling and being around humans, I, well, and being like, like, I say around humans, but like for handling and for being around and recommending for people if they want like a pet snake, I usually suggest corn snakes like Harley Quinn here. They are wonderful animals. And as far as a grouping of snakes, my favorite are the rat snakes and the colubrids. So colubrids are like rat snakes, king snakes, milk snakes, all those guys, um, beautiful animals. And uh, they're, they're all my favorites. <laughs> so yes. Hmm, how are snakes like humans? Well, each one has their own personality, like I discussed before with, with well, Harley Quinn too, and also Slytherin. Slytherin is a very special California king snake. If you worked with California king snakes before, some of them end up being very sweet, and some of them not so much. They might, uh, they, they may be a little bit nippy and things like that, or just want to eat everything. King snakes are kind of like that. Um, very, very different personalities, um, and reptiles, and even arachnids, like like Blondie, the Arizona blonde tarantula, and even frogs all have their own personalities. How are they like humans? Well, they have all the same organs that we have inside of our bodies. They're just long. So they're just long and spread out differently, right? But they have a heart, they have lungs, they have kidneys, they have all the things that we have. Liver, they're just stretched out and a little bit different. They don't have arms and legs, but they do have ribs and bones. So we as a mammal and a human, we're vertebrates. We have a backbone and bones throughout our body, right? These guys have bones as well. They're also vertebrates. They're not invertebrates. So in that way, we're similar, right? Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Can they sense fear? You're on a roll with these questions. Uh, no. So <laughs> they they can't sense like fear itself, but they can certainly um, judge your behavior. So if you're if you're touching an animal and you're you're going like this, oh my god, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what does that look like? That's a little bit scary. That's a little bit intimidating for you to be reaching after an animal and like like pulling away. Um, these guys can't really hear human speech, but if you're screaming at an animal and you scream in fear, that other animal that can hear can probably you know, sense that, that scream and wonder what the heck's going on. Um, it's more sensing your behavior, not really sensing the fear. Um, it's not like they can smell fear. That's totally a myth. Um, they can definitely smell smells. They're very, very um, good at smelling. In fact, snakes smell with their tongue. Oh, my camera didn't go out just now. I think that was an internet. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm back. If I was gone, I'm back. Um, but they, they're they very smell driven. But as far as smelling fear, nah, they can't really do that. It's it's your behavior. It's your body language, things like that, that they're, they're playing off of and trying to learn from. But honestly, don't tell her they're not that smart. Snakes, for the most part, aren't really the most intelligent animals. They're very instinctual. Um, they won't harm you if you're not harming them. So that's why most snakes, you know, can adapt to handling like this and be totally fine. Uh, I'm not hurting her. I'm also not food. So she has no reason to bite me because I'm not her food. I don't smell like food. I'm not handling rodents or something like that. So she has no reason to go into that food mode or defense mode. Good question. Can they emotionally connect? I don't know. That would be something that we, we can't really ask them and they can't tell us. I guess I could ask her. Do you emotionally connect? Now, I definitely emotionally connect to them because I can certainly vouch for that. <laughs> um, but we can't ask her, she can't tell us. 
as much as we do ask her, she can't say anything. So we don't know. I like to think that they, they do have some kind of connection or at least positive association, but they're animals. They're not humans. We don't want to, you know, turn them into humans emotionally. We don't know. But I like to think they definitely have a personality. I do know that. Um, so that there's probably something, right? She's definitely not afraid or acting scared or acting uh, aggressive or anything. So I would assume that she's pretty comfortable being held. Corn snakes are very, very easy to hold and adapt very well to those situations. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. You got, you're asking very deep questions tonight. And I love it so very much. Okay, Harley, you are fantastic. I hope we are all getting over some of our animal fears, like ophidophobia, which is the fear of snakes, right? You guys don't have to be afraid of snakes. Um, the most dangerous snake is still not dangerous <laughs> if you don't harm them or touch them, right? If you stay away from snakes, they can't harm you at all. There's no reason to be afraid. Snakes are just other another type of animal that should be respected. So um, a lot of people understand that a lion is dangerous, right? But are a lot of people just like irrationally afraid of lions? No, you're not gonna be, you know, hurt by a lion unless you mess with a lion, right? Same thing with a snake. Okay, guys, you can tell I'm very passionate about this, right? I hope you understand. Snakes are my favorite. Okay, now it's time to, it's confession time. Story time, <laughs> confession time. I have a fear of a certain type of animal. Here's my fear. I'm gonna show you. Hmm, this is my fear, or it used to be anyway. Does anybody know what this fear is? I bet you can guess. Those of you that already know me, please don't give it away. Now this is a very generalized word for the fear that I have, or had, I guess. I still have it a little bit, not gonna lie. It never really goes away totally. I don't expect anybody's phobias to go away totally, but I expect through exposure therapy for those fears to become less, right? Entomophobia. Does anybody know what an entomologist studies? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Bugs. This is my fear. Not all of them, not all the roaches, but cockroaches. I am very afraid of flying cockroaches. I don't think I'm alone, so I feel okay with it. But let me tell you, I have gotten a lot, 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 lot better about my fear. I can now look at them and be okay with it. Now, if a big old flying cockroach comes into my house, it's not great. I don't enjoy that. I usually leave and let somebody else handle that situation. Uh, yes, this this woman who is not afraid of venomous snakes and not afraid of most animals is afraid of flying roaches. I'm not afraid of spiders. I'm not really afraid of most insects. But uh, yes, I don't think anybody really enjoys flying cockroaches. All you entomologists out there, I do apologize if that's your favorite animal. But today we're going to discuss cockroaches and how I got over my fear. Now. Why am I afraid of flying cockroaches? It's the way they move, their sporadic movement, the flying, the, the randomness. Uh, if they were slow, I probably would be fine with it. If they were like crawling like that, like almost like a tarantula crawls, that's fine. I can handle that. But no, they're like, they're, and they come out of nowhere, right? Uh, they, they can fit into small crevices and cracks. So I think that's what it is. It's just all of a sudden they're there and they're so big. Little teeny tiny ones not so bad. I can, I can, I've, I've worked my way to being able to like handle those, not necessarily handle and hold, but like, like handle the situation. If you know what I mean, maybe shoo them out the door or just ignore them. Those, those, they're not great, but I don't, I no longer run screaming if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, can you imagine me running, scream, running and screaming from something? Um, yeah, me, the, the crazy animal lady afraid of roaches. That is the truth though. So it is definitely something I've had to get better at. So why don't we meet some roaches? <laughs> it's all fun and games until they have wings. That is so true. Everything cool until they fly. Everything's cool until they fly. I'm afraid of you? Is that what you're trying to say? 
humans can be scary. I think humans are the scariest uh, animal on the planet sometimes. That is so true. Okay, let's meet some roaches, shall we? These guys are not flying roaches. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this room with them. Um, I have a few Madagascar hissing cockroaches for you guys to meet today. I'm going to get them situated really fast. Madagascar hissing cockroaches come from, you guessed it, Madagascar. That is where they're from. It's right in the name. Uh, they do hiss for defense. So we are not the only animals with a phidophobia. Um, some animals in the animal kingdom otherwise are afraid of snakes as well. And that oftentimes is why animals hiss. Cats will hiss to mimic snakes and sound scary. These guys also hiss to mimic snakes and sound scary. I put them on their favorite food, which is bananas. They can get a little snack while they're out here. These are my five senior citizen roaches, which are quite elderly. Um, you might be wondering how long this species lives. Um, Madagascar hissing cockroaches can live to be around five. And these guys are around five now. So they're um, in retirement, if you will. They still do programs here and there, but they don't do a ton of them. And most of the time I do let them just eat some some delicious bananas while they hang out with us. But I do want to show you them a little bit closer up. This one's really pretty, I think. This one's actually going into molt. So it's a little bit darker. They can move quickly when they want to, but they don't usually move very quickly. Thumbs up, you guys. Here's one of our roaches. She is going into molt. And how I know that is because she's very, very dark right now. And then they molt out and they become uh, actually white when they molt out. And then very quickly and shortly then after, they will become um, kind of a lighter brown. And they're pretty cool. So like all insects, they have um, three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, unlike the spider with two body parts. And they have six legs instead of eight. And they do have antenna on top of their head, which they can use to um, sense taste and they can also smell a little bit i believe with their antenna and they also feel with their antenna so insects as opposed to arachnids have more senses than arachnids do typically typically not every animal is created equal right but i think these guys aren't so bad they don't have wings they don't move very fast but back in the old days younger amanda in the past past me uh did not handle these guys I did not want to handle Madagascar hissing, hissing cockroaches. I did not want to handle dubia roaches. I did not want to handle anything that was a roach. They really bothered me back in the old days. Okay. Um, so <laughs> why, Amanda, why? About what? <laughs> Bringing the roaches on. It's creepy crawly season. That's why, if that's what you're asking. Uh, yes, Madagascar, that is where they're from. They do hiss. They hiss for protection. Um, one of their main predators is the lemur. And lemur's main predators are actually the fossa, which is a mammal. And another one is a boa constrictor called the dumeril's boa constrictor. And those live in Madagascar too. And they can eat lemurs. They're very large snakes potentially can eat lemurs. Um, so Madagascar hissing cockroaches do hiss um, to ward off enemies. They also, if they happen to be male, will hiss to attract females. I'm gonna show you a male. That was a girl. I'm gonna show you the difference. Funny enough, these guys are actually dimorphic as a species, which means you can tell the difference between male and female. Oh, this is our little old man, Roach. He's got a little bit of substrate on top of him, so I'm blowing it away so you can see. So he has little bumps on the top of his kind of head area. It's kind of a helmet area that they have because their head is kind of in the front there. So cute. Um, he's kind of like, old man. Um, but he has little, uh, little bumps right here on his little helmet like area. And the female doesn't have those little bumps. You saw our girl earlier, right? Let's see. I think the rest of the ones I have right now are all girls to from as far as I can see. So the girls don't have the little bumps. See that? This is one of our other females. Hello, say hello to everyone. That's crazy, do they hiss at you? Sometimes, but not very often. The males hiss a lot more than the females, but now all of my adult roaches are all um, pretty old. <laughs> um, I do have several, <clears throat> so emotional. I do have several um, juvenile and baby roaches. These guys still do have a lot of young. 
for us. Um, this type of animal is actually a live bearing animal. They don't lay eggs, they give live birth and they do have um, a bunch of babies that they've given us. So I've got a bunch of those that are growing up but they're not super handleable at this time because they move a lot faster than the adults do. Once they become adults, they slow down quite a bit and uh, they kind of just don't have as many cares. Um, these guys do get pretty used to handling so they don't hiss nearly as much. The males hiss more, like I said, but it's pretty rare that they want to hiss. Good question. Now, how they hiss is really fun. Um, so breathing and hissing come from the same place. I want to show you a good example. So I'm going to switch roaches again. I have five of them to kind of switch around. So do, do, do. on this roaches abdomen here, you can see a little bit. Oh, there we go. So there's like a whole bunch of spots. Hmm, focus, focus. There's a whole bunch of like black spots all the way down. Boop, 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 boop. Kind of each section has its own little black spot. See that? I'm just holding her gently so you can see. There's spots all the way down on this side and on the other side as well, all the way down the body. Those are little holes. They're kind of like pores. And two out of these, um, all these holes make hissing noises. And that's how they breathe as well. That's going to be how they breathe and how they hiss. And what they do is they take in a puff of air and they hiss out of their, their sphericals is what those are called. So those little holes are called sphericals. Pretty neat. They don't have lungs like us. They have a totally different breathing system. And they don't breathe with their their mouth or head or nose. They don't have any of those in a nose. So they have sphericals instead. They do have a mouth though. So their mouth parts are a little bit different than our mouth, of course. We have that kind of mouth, as you guys know. Their mouth is right here. Very hard to see. But it's um, right here on their head. They have like little... Almost like more legs on their mouth like this and they kind of eat like this ah <sighs> yes we're coming into the home stretch you guys you guys have been facing your fears today i'm so very proud of you i hope you've loved learning about animal phobias and fears and some of the animals that are misunderstood in the animal kingdom here is a good question. What's their purpose in the natural ecosystem? Great question. Not only do they give food to lemurs and all kinds of other animals. So most of your insect type animals and invertebrates provide lots and lots of food to other animals. That's going to be their main purpose in life is being food for other, other animals, right? And having lots of babies and keeping up those numbers to be able to provide more and more food for other animals. But also these guys are what we, what we call detritivores. You've heard of carnivores that eat meat. You've heard of herbivores that eat plants. These are detritivores. They eat detrite, <laughs> which is dead and decaying plants dirt, soil, etc., which is on the, like the, the floor of the jungle in Madagascar. That's the word I'm looking for, the rainforest. They live in the rainforest in Madagascar and lots of plants and fruits and all kinds of things drop to the bottom of the forest floor. And that's where these guys come in. They're actually going to um, come around and eat all of that stuff, cleaning it up for us. And then when they use the restroom, that creates healthy soil. Isn't that neat? So they keep the ecosystem nice and um, clean by eating that and making it clean with their own bodies. And when it comes out the other end, it becomes healthy soil and more plants can grow again. So that's what they do for us and for the ecosystem. They also provide, like I said, food. See, there's one in molt or going molting soon. And this is how, kind of how they look after they molt. They're like a lighter color. Isn't that a big difference? Pretty cool. So that's what their their natural coloration usually looks like is like that that lighter brown but this one is due for a molt pretty cool when they come out of their molt whoa they'll ride down into their bananas um when they come out of the molt they're actually white and then they harden their exoskeleton again don't worry these guys are super tough i know they're old <laughs> but um their shell is super duper tough these guys can climb up a tree and jump out of the tree for safety purposes if they see a like a predator or something like that they don't climb a ton they're typically on the ground eating all kinds of things on the forest floor. But that's what they do. So these guys are also pretty clean. The reason that most roaches are not clean is because of what they eat. So most roaches are not detritivores eating only one type of thing, which is um, like plants, basically, mostly plants. Um, they, most roaches are omnivores eating like everything they see. So they can eat things like um, rotting bodies and carcasses. They can eat um, trash when it comes to living with humans, right? So lots of roaches are associated with being in the trash. And that's because they're not picky eaters. They can eat almost anything, right? 
So um, they end up picking up a lot of germs because of that. That is why most roaches in the animal kingdom and in the city <laughs> and things like that will go through a lot of our nasty garbage because of us that they're dangerous, but they carry diseases. They're going to go through all that nastiness carry the diseases on them, and then come into our lives and give us diseases. The reason that these guys don't have diseases is because number one, they're not eating those things. They're, they're very specified and specific to what they eat and specialized, right? They're detritivores eating detrite, <laughs> eating dead and decaying plant matter, mostly plants. And they'll also eat um, fresh plants too, like you saw eating fresh fruits. Um, but they also have a cleaning crew all over their body. So Madagascar hissing cockroaches have what we call Madagascar hissing cockroach mites. Now, normally we think of mites, it's like a gross thing, almost like a disease. But when it comes to these type of mites, think of like teeny tiny little Roombas living all over your body and cleaning your mess up all the time. They're like a little cleaning crew or vacuums all over their body and they help to take care of all those germs. So these guys actually have little mites all over their body that only live on Madagascar hissing cockroaches. I don't know if you can see any of them. They are super tiny. They're really hard to see. They're almost microscopic, not microscopic. You can see them to the naked eye, but on camera, let's see if we can see them. Hmm. I wonder if I turn her over, if you can see any mites. Hmm. Let's try to look. Hmm. Hmm. I believe I do see a couple of them. They're kind of white. They're super duper tiny. They're smaller than a pinhead. Wow, I think I see some there. I don't know if you guys can. Pretty neat. But what they do is they kind of travel all over the Madagascar hissing cockroaches body and clean up as they go, eating all the germs, eating all the level. And this species of mite only lives on this species of cockroach. Isn't that incredible? So they're kind of like their own little ecosystem too. If it weren't for this roach, that family or group of mites would have anywhere to go or live. Yeah, so that's their natural purpose, I hope. I hope that answers your question. So let's show you guys the roaches together in one cluster together again, and then we'll let these retired roaches rest. How about that? Aww, did you ever think it would be cute to see roaches eating? I think they're cute. Now, again, this is something that I've had to warm up do to doing. Um, definitely in the past, past me, maybe 10 years ago or so, never, ever, ever would I want to be around these guys ever. I thought they were super scary. They remind me too much of my fear, which is those wild roaches, right? That can fly and move really fast and scare me so much. I was very stubborn about it. I didn't want to be anywhere near these guys. And I kind of was mostly forced to work with them at places that I worked, um, either with feeder roaches like dubia roaches, which are common feeder animals to lizards and things, or with these guys, animal ambassadors sometimes. These guys are also... Um, sometimes fed out to other animals too. That was definitely a thing as well. But here they're animal ambassadors. They love each other, I think so too. So yes, um, this animal and most cockroaches, as you probably know, are very social. They are colony animals. A lot of insects are like that. Um, they have safety in numbers, right? Sorry for my shaky hand, it's hard to hold up my hand. I guess I'm getting old too. <laughs> um, it's hard to hold up this angle for a while. It's a good shot of them. Oh my goodness, I hope this is our our cover photo for YouTube. Are you listening to me, YouTube? This would be a great photo. Pretty neat. Happy Halloween, everyone. Um, but they are very social. They live in big groups together. They are very, very um, good to one another. They don't bite one another. They don't attack each other. Um, they share food. They share all the mites together that they, I was talking about, their little Roombas all over their body. They do, of course, breed together, male and females. And then they have more babies and those babies will stay in the colony too. Pretty awesome. And their purpose is to feed other animals as well as cleaning up the planet for us by cleaning up dead plants and all kinds of fallen fruits and making the soil healthy by digging through the soil and using the restroom and creating more fertilized soil and environment for other plants to grow. Isn't that cool? Well, I hope you guys have learned a lot today and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Halloween coming up. If you happen to be in San Antonio, we will be here at a festival um, all day long on Halloween the 31st over at Arbor Park Shopping Center. Um, if you need more information on how to get there and the address and the times and all of that, you can go to onceinawild.com to find all of our events going on as well as our social media like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all those things. We'll have those posted as well, especially Instagram and YouTube. I'm sorry, Instagram and Facebook will have all those things posted. But again, onceinawild.com is the place to be to find all that information on the upcoming events.
And uh, that one on Halloween is all day and public to and 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 you know available for anybody here in the San Antonio, Texas area to come and visit us. We will have some pretty awesome animals out there. Um, as many animals as we can with the chilly weather. It's been a little bit colder than it usually is um, the last few days. So we'll see who makes an appearance. We know that Sandor the rabbit's going to be there. We know that guinea pigs are going to be there and probably our tortoises as well. Um, we'll see how cold it is more or less, but we'll do our very best. And I don't believe the roaches will be there because these guys are definitely tropical. So they don't really enjoy cold weather at all, but we shall see. So we would love to see you guys out of that event. On October the 30th, we're going to have another virtual event with some of the characters from Harry Potter. We're going to have Ron, Hermione, and of course, Harry coming out into the studio with us here um, at Once in a Wild. And they're going to be joining us for a special extra live stream. So please check that out as well. It's going to be interactive just like this one. And we're going to have some different creepy crawly animals on the show and animals that make sense for Harry Potter. So I hope you're excited. Stay tuned to all the things happening. And... We hope to see you next time. It was lovely to see all of you out here today. And uh, I hope you have a great evening as well, Viviana. And we love you too, Amanda. And thank you for joining us. And we shall see you guys next time. We are nothing to be ordinary, but we love to be your friends. Hold our hands and let's have fun together. Singing as loud as you can. Everybody singing. Okay, guys, we'll see you here next week for our regularly scheduled Wednesday once in a wild show. And we'll hopefully see you guys on Friday for our extra show with Harry Potter characters. And we hope to see you in person on the actual day of Halloween here in the San Antonio, Texas area. But whenever we see you again, we'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys. <laughs>